we have to make our agenda, which we which said that we have to make our agenda. By, by 2030, the economy of, of, of our country on the agriculture sector have to, to grow by 10%. That's our target. So you can't talk about the growing the economy from, through agriculture without considering about the soil. This is a big, very big agenda. But uh, on, this, on this aspect of the, of the strategy, the agriculture strategy that we, that we have, we said that uh, we, Tanzania, we sit, we're still lagging behind. Because our export currently is just laying 1.5 billion US dollar per year. But uh, we do expect on this agenda, we have to move to over 5 billion US dollar per year. So we have to concentrate more on, on, the, on, the, on this way. So, but uh, as a, when I come to your question, you said uh, the challenge that we are, we are going to face currently, the, the, the first challenge is a part of awareness. Because sometimes community people, maybe they can lag behind to know the the, the, the concept of the thought, the, the challenge of the that's the that is the very very big, big challenge. But another challenge is overspending on the natural resources that we have. You know, majority of people depend mostly on the on the land. So the, the, the pressure on the land is become so high because sometimes there is unsustainable agriculture farming or left of fishing or, or mining. This pressing the pressure on the, on the soil. So this is this is another big challenge. But another one is just uh, in a, in inadequate data on, on the on the soil status, because especially on the on the ecological uh, agroecological zone. So you, you can find that you want to make investment, but uh, sometimes maybe you lack some information. How are you going to invest in on a certain area? So the in a, in inadequate data, the proper data on the on the on the, on the agro, agroecological zone, that's uh, among, among another challenge. But uh, and sometimes we have this uh, problem: how to to know the, 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 the extent of the problem on the on the on the soil earth. This is another another challenge because sometimes, for example, if we want to make investment on the on the on especially on the agro industries, if you want to find the, the maybe you want to know the maybe salinity or acidity of the soil, so you need to know the magnitude of the of the problem. So this is among the challenge. But what I can say that Tanzania has decided to make more investment on the on this other aspect. That's why we decided just to, to, to change even our, our budget. Our country budget three years ago was, as, as compared to, to current budget, it's almost four times. This is so how big investment we decided to make to go on the, on the part of the country. But the major consumption of the soil. So shortly I can say that Tanzania decided to, to make more concentration on the agriculture, but we have to concentrate on the, on the soil. But on this area, what we are looking for is just how we can partner with the barriers partners the world so to support on this component of the agriculture, especially on the local forest, forest, especially part of technology, capacity building to our people. Even how to look at the innovations, how we can have the proper may mechanism, how to move. But another is on the part of finance, because we can't maybe make more good investment on the soils without having finance. So as Tanzania, I can say that uh, we have decided that uh, if you want maybe to, to, to move forward, we need to concentrate more on agriculture. But we, we can't talk about agriculture development without concentrating on the soil. So the soil is our big agenda. That's why we are looking for the various partners, various researchers, and the other parts who we can maybe work together. Because we can't work on our, our, our solution. We have to, to, get to, to, to be on the teamwork. So we are looking forward. We want to be a champion in Africa. Seriously. We want to be a champion in short, coming, in sh in short years to come. That to be a champion of agriculture, especially on the concentration of the soil risk. Thank you. Yep, thank you very much, Minister. And just a quick follow up on that. Um, if you think about the challenges you face, the things that you're, you, you really want to go further yet, what would you see as being your, your, your passion for, get, for getting there? For example, is it, is it training? Is it winning investment? Uh, where do you re really want to push towards? First of all, the we, we, we are looking for the, for the capacity building. Well, you know that the capacity building is the main component of the of, of achievement. So we are looking for the capacity, uh, capacity building to our people, especially farmers, even the officers who, who are supporting the extension officers on the capacity building on various aspects. But another one is on the part of technology, because we can't move without having a proper technology to address certain challenges. So this is other, other area. But we are, we are welcoming the innovations. If we have the proper innovation in the world now, how we can move properly. For example, I have my friend here from Yara, the best, best friend of mine, because 
among the people who we are using their services are from here. That's why I'm so happy to say that. So, the part of technology, how we can have a proper technology that will, pro that will protect soil. But another area is on the part of finance, because finance just can trigger anything just to go for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Well, I'm going to um, turn now to an, another home team, um, for, uh, OCP representative, uh, country manager for Kenya, Karimi Thuranira. And Karimi, give us your vision of how OCP is, is working to support sustainable soil management. Uh, not just in Kenya, but in developing countries. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, to put it into context, uh, OCP is a global producer of plant nutrition uh, solutions. And uh, we strongly believe that consumption and production um, can act as key levers in, uh, of course, in agriculture to ensure that uh, we address the issues of uh, the triple planetary crisis that we are facing. So uh, for start now, that is uh, where we are. But we believe that uh, there are obviously solutions around uh, soil health uh, in Africa. And uh, farmers do face a lot of challenges. So of course, uh, as uh, big contributors to the food security agenda in, uh, in Africa. We uh, support farmers in, uh, at least I'll mention uh, key areas, uh, three key areas where we support farmers in soil health management. So the first one is uh, uh, in, the, in the running now the school lab in uh, Africa, where we have mobile laboratories that go straight to the villages to do soil testing for farmers and provide key recommendations for, for soil and for fertilizers that they need to use. So of course, uh, these uh, fertilizers that we keep uh, uh, talking to the farmers are, are customized uh, solutions. So we are not, uh, we believe that uh, uh, one fertilizer does, cannot be a solution for farmers uh, cannot be a broad solution for farmers. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we do is that in Africa, we have uh, really made uh, big strides in uh, doing soil mapping. So we've mapped uh, 50 million hectares. And uh, this uh, 50 million hectares out of this exercise, we have uh, developed 44 customized solutions. These 44 customized solutions are for about uh, 10 uh, value chains. We know very well that uh, just uh, uh, in the last one year or so, when there was this war, Africa was uh, thrown into a grain crisis. And we believe that, uh, of course, uh, uh, with these customized solutions that uh, address different value chains, we can be able to uh, have diversity of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of crops being, uh, being available. Then uh, the other thing that uh, we do also is that we promote the judicial use of fertilizers. So uh, how we do this, of course, is that uh, we, have set, uh, we have set up uh, uh, around Africa 5,000 demos that act as centers of excellence. Now, these uh, demos, uh, we ensure that we uh, train the farmers build the capacity around, of course, uh, uh, introducing them to regenerative uh, practices. We're talking about no-till, intercropping. And uh, of course, uh, we are also strong promoters of uh, the 4 r stewardship, which we are talking about, uh, of course, ensuring that uh, these uh, plant nutrition solutions are there for the farmers uh, in the right place, at the right time, the right uh, quantities, and, um, and so forth. So uh, by doing this, we ensure that farmers are holistically uh, trained on what to do and which crops they can be able, of course, to plant on their farms. Uh, so by this, of course, we ensure that we are addressing cell health and also uh, acting on uh, production. Lastly, um, uh, another very big initiative is that uh, we believe that uh, uh, 
uh, agriculture can play a big role in decarbonizing. Uh, uh, it, 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 agriculture can play a big role in in uh, in uh, carbon uh, in carbon in, car in carbon sequestration. And therefore, what we intend to do in this is that we are going to we have set aside uh, three million. Uh, we are going, we have targeted three million hectares that we intend now to uh, start carbon farming in Africa. 50% of this uh, land is in Africa. The other land we're talking about is uh, global. So of course you can see that there are a lot of initiatives around where we think that the arable land is, the, the bulk of the arable land is, and this we believe will also help in supporting, of course, the soil health and the uh, production. So these are, I think, the main areas uh, that uh, we are focusing on is OCP. And it, from what I hear, you're a very active company in all these things. Um, but is it only working as a company, or can you, can you see opportunities for working in partnership with governments, in public-private partnerships? Is that something that's happened yet, or is that something in the future? Well, uh, uh, we cannot be able to act uh, uh, as a lone ranger in this effort. Therefore, we work collaboratively, collaboratively with uh, governments and uh, private uh, players who are like-minded to be able to bring, uh, to ensure that we achieve, of course, uh, some of these agendas and uh, outcomes that we, we are talking about uh, in, in, in this uh, summit. Very good, thank you. Um, I want to not leave it too long until we actually go to a farmer. Um, so I want to come directly to A.G. Uh, Kawamura. A.G., we were speaking already at lunchtime, and I understand you're, as well as uh, representing the major farmer group in UNEP, you're also a farmer yourself in California. Um, so give us your vision of, of soil health and, and what it actually means to you to make that connection between soil health and business. Hello everybody, good uh, afternoon, pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm lucky to say that I'm an urban farmer or, or a farm in, farmer in an urban area and I'm uh, 67 years old and in those say 50 plus years that I've actually been pretty active in farming activity, uh, the changes have been significant and, and actually tremendous. Uh, I was mentioning at lunchtime, my neighbor just retired from farming, he's 98 years old uh, he retired two years ago. He was born in 1925. Um, in 1927, we might know that there were two billion people on the planet. Uh, my friend, who, uh, who in his early teens remembers the names of the horses he used to plow his fields, uh, because tractors hadn't showed up in Southern California yet at, in that area. And I farm near Disneyland, near Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, in our history, many of you flown into LAX, we were uh, farming as a family around that area before the LAX was really built out. So it was all farmland. I farm in Orange County as our home for the most of all my life. Uh, and Orange County, when I was uh, born, was one of the top agricultural production uh, counties in all of America, uh, amazingly. And um, but it was fruits and vegetables more than any other kind of commodity crops. And so with fruits and vegetables, it's an irrigated uh, kind of a crop and also with irrigation, we live in a Mediterranean climate and we can't uh, really depend on the rain. And so talking about arable land is really important, but what is arable land? Uh, we also uh, have friends and work with uh, partners near the desert, or in the desert, and that's, a desert is a desert. It's some of the most stable climate uh, in the world, but it's also the driest climate. But when you add water and you know your weather right and you have the right selection of crops, it's amazing what you can produce on ground that's not considered arable, just as a, just as a placeholder. Um, it's always been said, and it's always true, because I know it for it to be true, uh, is that good soil makes the farmer look good. So if you happen to get the farm on good soil or an area that has great soil, you're gonna have a pretty good chance of being a good farmer, um, unless you really screw up. Now, in that same, in that same argument, I've been a landless farmer in my area for over 35 years. In other words, the land that we owned as a family, uh, we stopped farming on that years ago, and there was a, at the time plenty of land around in our area to be able to use in an urban, peri-urban area. And as they pulled out other crops like citrus trees, the vegetable farmers like I am were able to come right behind these other uh, folks and farm in those areas. 
And the interesting thing about good soil and bad soil um, and dead soil, you mentioned. Dead soil does not mean it's bad soil. Uh, we've been able to take what you would consider dead soil and I always remember learning from a, a guy that showed up, a science, a soil scientist, agronomist showed up, and I don't have a science background. And at the time, about 40 something years ago, he says, well, you of course know in a healthy teaspoon of soil that there's a billion microbes, individual organisms in the teaspoon of soil. And I thought the guy was pulling my leg and I said, yeah, with a B, are you kidding? But it's true, a healthy soil, you understand what healthy soil is because you'll see it in your crops. The crops, immediately you can tell the, the, the tilth of the soil and how well it grows. When you pick up a piece of ground that's dead, in other words, it's sterile, there's just not that many microbes in it, and maybe there's a million in it, or whatever the low number is, what's amazing and what's really amazing to many of us is how resilient soil can be if you can reintroduce biology into the soil and recreate tilth and recreate organic matter so that you go from a very low count up to much higher. And now there's also soil amendments that helps you feed the microbes so that you can feed the soil, so they can feed the plant. That's been a pretty good, big revolution in the last uh, 25, 30 years, even though that's in terms of indigenous knowledge and how, how you would understand how not to screw up your soil, is you're always wanting to improve your soil. You're always trying to figure out how to make it more productive by not killing it, by not making it sterile, by not making it uh, too salty. And you, there's so many ways that that happens where you ruin your soil over time, and, we as a world have learned the hard way, evidently, and we keep on learning, uh, that we come and go in understanding how important soil is, but sometimes we come and go in understanding how quickly we can ruin an entire area or an entire farm by just doing the wrong practices. So I'll, I'll leave it by saying, it depends what you're growing, it's depending, are you irrigating, are you depending on the rain, this is the nice rain that we just had, are you, are you dealing with lots of rain that brings floods in to help leach your soil salts out? Are you dealing with uh, situations where the ground is actually so poor that you're literally uh, keeping your plants alive like uh, with a patient with an IV tube because you have to feed everything because there's not that much stuff in the ground but you can feed it the nutrients it needs. And so as we start to look at what our options are in the year 2024, this idea that we're in an agricultural renaissance, there's so much more in our toolbox than we've ever had before and that just gives us a glimmer of hope that there's opportunities to take bad situations and, and have remediation and help them uh, do better. And we can talk about contamination and other things too. But for now, it's just to say that we're fortunate to be able to know that soil is our future. You know, we need all the tools in the toolbox to help us manipulate it, to work with it, and it help but make sure that it, it gives us what we hope we can get from it by investing in it. Yeah, thank you, AG. And I just a, a quick follow-up. At lunch time, we were talking about fertigation, um, and I understand you're in a pretty dry situation. It's going to be irrigated, but fertigation putting in the, the nutrients as well. I mean, obviously, I, uh, you might want to say a bit more about that uh, as to why it's economical or efficient, but do you see there's also a possibility for helping the soil health? Yeah, I think it's really important to understand that on our planet, we talk about different kinds of agriculture that takes place. Uh, an enormous amount, I think in Africa, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, 80, over 80% 80 is rain fed. You, you, you hope the rains come in the right patterns and you're able to get your crop. Uh, in, in an area where, like where I farm in these Mediterranean, Mediterranean climates with really moderate temperatures uh, but no rainfall, the irrigation becomes critical. Uh, in my lifetime, we went from furrow irrigation, running water down the ditch uh, with, with uh, just uh, using a furrow system and, and using some canals to bring the water into an area, right? We went to sprinklers. A lot of farmers, you look over the fence and you see what your neighbors are doing, and we were not the early, early innovators, early adopters necessarily, but we could see that our neighbors were doing better than we were, and then we went to, from furrow irrigation to sprinklers, then from sprinklers to drip irrigation. With each leap forward, you started to see efficiencies, you started to see a little bit more precision. Uh, when we got lasers to come in and actually laser the ground to make sure that it's, it's at the fall line, the water leaves your field in an even, even pattern, that's another kind of efficiency that you used to use. Now, it's interestingly, you don't use lasers anymore. You use a satellite to give you the same amount of things that can m tell a tractor how to uh, put your field in play. So the answer is, as far as precision agriculture in everything you do, um, these are the tools in the toolbox that helps a big farmer or a small farmer, but they're there and if they're made available, that's what the, where the hope lies. Great. Uh, let's pass over to Lee now. 
and uh, and the mic as well. That's me, AG. Um, so Lee, I, I understand you're a researcher. You're, you're based at Aircraft. Um, so you tell us about what you see as the, the global threats for soil health. I mean, there's, as we've heard, lots of different kinds of soils in the world. But yeah, what's your vision? And what do you see as the, the threats and, and how we need to go about it? Okay. I will start as AJ did. So yes, I am Lee Winowicki. I'm a soil scientist. I work at World Agroforestry, just across the fence. And I started my career as a soil scientist in Arusha. And I love being a soil scientist because it's such a great way to start a conversation with farmers in Tanzania. Havariza udongo mwakehi, right? <laughs> How is your soil doing this year? And you can just keep the conversation going. So for when I think about this question about what the biggest threats are, while physically the greatest threat is land degradation. 80% is rain-fed agriculture in Africa, 67% of our agricultural land in Africa is degraded, over almost 40% of the Earth's surface is degraded. The most widespread form of degradation, soil erosion. However, I think, and this is because of unsustainable land management practices, but when I think more philosophically about these pressing threats, it's a dire threat if we continue to overlook the critical importance of soil. And I think UNEA, COP28, COP27, the upcoming summit, we're going to make sure that soil health is on the agenda and it's no longer overlooked because we recognize our existence, our health, relies on healthy soil. It's ubiquitous, so we often take it for granted, but we must start paying more attention. And another kind of philosophical threat is we need to collaborate and we need action now. We have no time to waste, so we really need this collective action to make sure we're scaling healthy soil practices globally, we're monitoring it, we're communicating, and so maybe more philosophical what some of the pressing uh, issues are. So um, you've talked about you know, the main challenge being soil degradation. Uh, but just unpack for, for everybody here what you actually mean by soil degradation because uh, you know, there's a whole load of biological, physical, nutrient things in that. Can you unpack that a bit? Are you trying to answer my question? No, no, no. You, you go for it. <laughs> yeah, so there's many forms of degradation. So you can have biological degradation where you just don't have that biological activity. There was just that carbon uh, workshop next door. Soil carbon is biologically mediated. It cycles through microorganisms not one time, not 10 times, not a thousand times, thousands of times. So if we want nutrient cycling, so we don't have chemical degradation, we need those organisms to cycle and make sure that we have the nutrients and the carbon. And of course, physical degradation is the most com common form we think of because we can see erosion. We can see the gully erosion. We can, hopefully not on the UNEP campus, um, see water, uh, soil washing away in the water. Thank you very much. Well, let's pass to you, Arani, from, from Yara. Uh, I have to say I'm not quite sure what Yara stands for anymore. I think it's something to do with a Norwegian ship. Yeah, and, uh, the, the, we have the Viking ship as a logo, but the Yara is actually, so it was spun off as a, from another conglomerate in 2004, and when we chose the name, it is actually the 12th rune, which stands for a good year, a good yield. Uh, so it has a story behind the name. Very good. Well, well, so tell us about your, your company, yeah, your, your I, vision, I, for if, if you your allow, global company, I understand. Yeah, but if you allow me, I, I would like to speak not that much about Yara. I would rather start, you know, and, and I had a conversation with Ernie here uh, during another session today, and and my friend here, you know, I think it's, you know, we need to start with the farmers. Uh, and I think that you know, they are kind of the stewards of the soil uh, and the front line of defense, if you like. So I think that's one, one key part. And we are putting increased demands on the farmers. Uh, and if we want them to kind of be even better stewards, and we need to, for humanity to invest better in soils, we need to give them the tools, we need to give them the opportunity to get those income streams. 
So this is about finance coming to the right people when they need it. So I think that's it for me, a starting point. But then, going back to what, what Leanne said, I think, you know, we, if I'm not wrong, if we continue at the pace that we have now on land degradation, by 2050, 90% of the world's soils and land will be fully degraded. And that means, as a farmer said to me a year ago, I'm losing my runway. And, and that means that we as humanity, we are losing our runway. So if we don't start investing in soil and soil health, we will lose that runway and opportunity. And I think that is my call. So, so from the Yara side, I think you know, we have some knowledge, some, some services, some, some contacts or relationships. But we are putting that into the kind of the public space, public domain, because we see we all need to kind of come together and mobilize around this agenda. And I think this is also my, my brother from Tanzania here. You know, we, we, we actually had opportunity to meet with your President Samia in Oslo you know, a couple of weeks ago. And, and as we said, you know, how can we bring data and knowledge? How can we identify, you know, you have acidic soils, what are the hot spots? How, you know, you have liming resources in the country. How do we get the investments case? And between public and private, how do we actually collaborate to make that happen? And how do we mobilize youth in your country to actually be part of that distribution and supporting these small the farmers. You know, these are the type of things we need to work on together. Uh, and I think, you know, being here on, on, at, at, um, in this compound, I think, you know, there's also a unique opportunity for UN environment because what we need to, you know, we, we, we've had many of these discussions in the, call it the food ag sector, but if we can't mobilize the ministers of environment and some of those funds that are available under climate and climate, climate adaptation, we won't get there. So, so I will also actually give a little bit of a call to action from, from the UN environment side to really get, you know, how do we all come together to drive this agenda? So I think that's kind of my, my short intervention. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get a picture of you as a global company from Norway developing your vision. How do you, how do you get that vision yeah, so, which is meeting the vision for all the different expectations? Yeah, so, so, so we've been in this, you know, we were the first company in the world to capture and, and fix nitrogen from the air back in 1905. So we've been on working on crop nutrition and working with farmers for more than 100 years. Uh, we sell to about 150 countries around the world, have operations in 60 countries, so we're a truly global operation. And we do that across all kinds of nutrients. Um, but I think, you know, for us, what we have set as our ambition and where we're going as a company, how can we contribute to drive a more nature positive food future? Mm -hmm. And we've done that across three kind of key pillars of work. One is climate neutrality, which has a lot of doing with upstream act aspects, so how do we actually decarbonize ourselves, shift to green ammonia, etc. Um, the other one is regenerative ag. And, and that's where a lot of these things come, you know, becoming a label of many efforts. So how do we drive nutrient management and nitrogen use efficiency, how do we get kind of the soil health you know, agenda, how do we improve biodiversity, we heard about you know, the fertigation, so the whole water management, so you know, water pollution issues, all of that needs to come together, so that's the second pillar. And the third one, as I more than started with, is prosperity and farmer prosperity, because if we can't do this with the, you know, improved opportunities and income for farming communities, it won't work. So, so that's kind of where we are going as a company and we're using our tools, our means to help that drive that agenda. So one of the things that Arnie just mentioned, I think is relevant for all of us on the panel, is, is your, the future outlook of soils getting worse in many places by 2050. Uh, not yet getting better, uh, but, but surely there are examples of where the situation is already turning around. Um, and it's, you know, I, I think the, perhaps the most famous example everybody learned in school was the Dust Bowl of, of North America in the 1930s or whenever it was. And clearly that was, let's say, not doing it right, taking out more than was putting in, not protecting the soil surface. But can you guys give us um, some examples of where you think um, it's really turning around? No, so you're going to have to shout up because this is for any of you uh, to give examples of, you got one already, Lee? Okay. Turning around for the positive that's going to help meet Arnie's vision for the future of better soil health. All of our vision. So, so actually, I think there's a really nice example right here with the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. So in that, it, there's a massive aim to restore landscapes. 
And if we think only about planting trees, it, that's not going to be the solution because trees grow in soil. So I think already there's been very positive um, solutions. Today we had seven flagships um, present their work. All of them had a component of restoring soil, farmer prosperity, and tree cover. And I just want to bring up a really important aspect of that. Anecdotes, stories, photos are fantastic. But as a scientist, and as we hope to increase investment in soil health five to ten fold above current commitments, we're going to need the evidence base. So really investing in implementation, but also the monitoring so that we can see and have real numbers for you, hectares, percent carbon increased, erosion decreased, tree cover increased. So I think generating that evidence is going to be absolutely critical. And this is where I think having this unique panel where we can have this collaboration, where we can innovate around monitoring tools. We heard Tanzania say, we need the data, we need it in a usable form, and we need it now to make decisions. So. I think there are positive examples and it's a real call to action that we invest more into the monitoring so we have the real numbers. Okay, I'm gonna pass over first to Karimi on my left and then to you, AG, uh, afterwards. Okay, thank you. So uh, we definitely have lots of success stories to give. So it's not all uh, gloom about uh, soil health. I know we are talking about uh, land regradation, uh, like uh, it's getting worse. Yes, it's getting worse, but uh, their solutions and their, uh, we're also getting success stories across the globe. So uh, one of the areas I can be able to say that uh, we've really uh, seen incredible results is in Ethiopia. So Ethiopia had a serious situation, of course, of uh, land degradation, of course, low yields, and uh, of course, they were uh, using, uh, uh, you know, just uh, uh, standard uh, uh, solutions, plant uh, nutrition solutions. So what OCP did is part of what we do is collab collaborating with partners is that we collaborated with uh, the Ethiopian government and we did soil mapping. And out of that soil mapping, we were able to develop a customized uh, formulation that was so effective that has seen Ethiopia increasing its yields by close to over 40%. If I mention the percentages, they might just sound uh, ludicrous, but uh, we're talking about uh, a significant change of where there's no food to where there is a surplus. And now Ethiopia clearly is, a, is an exporter of uh, teff and wheat and uh, many of uh, uh, the neighboring countries are also getting food from Ethiopia. And that is out of this uh, soil mapping. We've seen also efforts that we've done in, uh, in Nigeria where we have set up uh, blending uh, uh, facilities and these blending facilities have, uh, of course, uh, they have, uh, they produce uh, formulations that are specific for the different uh, states in Nigeria. And we've also seen some uh, commendable uh, results in that. So I can say that uh, uh, they're, they're good results. And I'll say also when you talk about also partnerships, We've seen that uh, uh, when partners come together, different partners, for us as OCP, we use uh, different partners, uh, we collaborate with different partners with different experience, with different expertise. We have uh, international financial institutions, so like uh, we work with the uh, World Bank and IFC, where we have uh, signed uh, financing agreements. Uh, we've done uh, with IFC about $100 million to support value chains. And this, we've started seeing uh, uh, results also in West Africa, where the financing aspect in uh, agriculture has been uh, incorporated. So it's not just in agriculture, but it is in soil health management. So also uh, for World Bank, we've seen um, uh, an intervention that we've had where we've signed an agreement with them, with the World Bank for 5 million, targeting 5 million farmers 
again, uh, to target uh, more than 10 value chains, it's also working. And we're seeing it at the ground level that there are results that you can get when you collaboratively work with uh, partners who are uh, working on uh, soil, soil health. Thanks so much. And I just want to press you a bit more. One of the things you said was the Ethiopia example. You, you mentioned about the soil mapping and you mentioned about the improvement of yield. But I, I want to understand a bit the, the gap between the two of those because obviously mapping is giving you more information somehow. That information has helped them go to increase yield. So what were the steps in between that went from the mapping to the increased yield? Because it sounds like it was a strategic plan. Well, it was a strategic plan first and foremost, of course, uh, governments must create a conducive environment for the soil mapping to be done. So uh, as much as there are players here that would be interested in doing soil mapping, the governments have to uh, introduce a conducive environment for that. So that is what was uh, the first step in Ethiopia. So, of course, uh, uh, was to also lay ground on what are the specific issues. So, of course, there was the issue of, uh, uh, there was low yields. Uh, clearly, uh, Ethiopia was a net uh, uh, importer of, of food, and they needed to get to a point where they have food security. So, and one of the, the areas they thought that they needed to do is agriculture. Of course, we know in Africa, uh, agriculture anchors the uh, uh, majority of the economies. So uh, that was actually one of the first areas to do. And uh, uh, so of course, uh, uh, they got now into the, allowed OCP to do the soil mapping, an exercise that took uh, a while uh, we, of course, the data that we got, we had to take it to our our science uh, 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 agronomy team. Of course, had to work on that to get what would be the best combination of solutions that would uh, would be work best in Ethiopia, and that is what uh, happened. Thanks, and I promise to give the mic next to Ag. We've still got this same question, so go for Ag. You know, we had mentioned, and the word solutions keeps on coming up. Uh, I, I'm just uh, privileged to work with a group called Solutions from the Land, and it, it's a group made out of farmers, foresters, ranchers, folks that are the stewards of the land, and it's been driving us in our way of understanding that there really is a tremendous new way of looking at what, what we can do and what we can accomplish on our farms, all the different benefits, whether they're ecosystem benefits, economic benefits, the circularity of, of getting things better than they were before. Um, the talk about uh, how important it is to understand that large landscapes, large watersheds, is basically the best starting place for us to look around the world of how do we improve region by region is by understanding the, the watershed that you're farming in, because that will give you a clue on not only soil type, but on what's possible, what's not possible, what's not happening in terms of water retention, maybe your aquifer underneath. Um, there's so much to be learned, but if thinking there's one silver bullet, there's one way to do it, that's probably the biggest mistake we have. And, and that gets us back to this idea um, we can continue to study things, and uh, there was a remark we made the other day about um, the think tank is so important, and we're the first to say, well, uh, okay, I think it's better to start thinking about a do tank, or, you know, look at a do tank with where you're putting your resources to making things happen, because you have proof of concept all over the planet of great, great projects that are restoring land, that are restoring forests, that are taking a look at the resource base and making them more sustainable, more resilient. Uh, I have a good example. Uh, in our own uh, state of California, there has been a rule recently that says you can't take green waste and put it to the dump anymore. You've got to s find a place for it and turn it into compost, a soil amendment, turn it into energy. And on a, a farm that we ran, the farm on it, so again, it's a, it's a, a farm that we, we don't own, um, but we're able to work and take green waste that's been what, almost fully composted, but brought out to us and where we can turn it and make it into a soil amendment mm -hmm and I can get some small amount of credits for doing that, which helps my bottom line. And that's just the kind of innovation that you start to see taking place everywhere. Um, organic matter is really important, whether it's char, whether it's, uh, um, uh, or the by byproduct of uh, organic matter, but it's 
something that you want to feed your microbes. I think we said it just a second ago. You feed the soil to feed your plants is the way you look at things these days. And I, I think I would finish by saying that when we can look at large landscapes, that toolbox that I was mentioning, sure there's technological tools, but there's political tools, there's uh, conservation tools, there's government tools in that box once they get liberated, if you will, so that we can start to really make things happening, not in a one-size-fits-all, but in a region-by-region. Region. Let's give them a chance and let it move forward. And that's how you end hunger on a planet. That's how you start to deal with food security in a different way than we've been looking at it before. Very good. I, w I want to come on a bit to visions here, and it may be that Arnie's, you can take a bit of the visions at the same time. You've got the mic, but I've got the question. Um, <laughs> and I think it would be remiss of me uh, without challenging you as a panel to, I mean, you've said you no know, one size fits all, different visions. There's visions of, of fertilizer, for example, and you know, I, I work with people who say, well, organic farming's never gonna do it because if you want the quantity of food, you're gonna need the fertilizers. Um, and there'll be others who say, no, no, for us, organic farming is the way, and, and, and we'll say that is you know, a particular way towards soil health. Obviously, you're a fertilizer company. I, I don't know whether Lee is going to give us a pitch on natural farming or not, uh, but let's take you afterwards, Lee. And, but let's take you first. What would you say to the organic farmers who, who disbelieve you? Give us your, your pitch. No, I, I, I hope and, and, and believe we should have moved beyond this binary discussion. Um, and, and a little bit back to what was said earlier, I think you know, it's like, how can technology support biology? So we need to start with what is nature, pro you know, what can nature provide to us? How do we actually use whatever organic material we have available and do that in a smart way? And that also needs to be done with more precision, to be honest. Um, because you know, if you look at runoffs in, in you know, Europe where I live, you know, organic material is as much an issue today than is actually mineral fertilizer. And then you actually need to be much more precise. I think, you know, we, uh, as was also, you know, shared from OCP here, you know, it's like we moved away from the more, which is still an issue in many places that, you know, these blanket solutions of, of, of type of, of fertilizer and nutrients to be much more precise. Um, and I think that's, that's, you know, I can give one example here from Kenya, you know, it's like, as, as we showed the government last year, you know, if we do the, the right nutrients based on soil conditions and the crops, with also including micronutrients and doing that in a cost-effective way. Doing that on one third of the maize field in the country would close the maize uh, gap in the country. You know, so, so, that, that is, so the opportunities are there, the knowledge is there, but how do we apply it? That said, I think is that we need to move beyond this and especially on the soil health agenda. It needs to be, so what we as companies do, we're obviously supporting individual farmers or farmer groups. And we try to bring that obviously part, partly on commercial terms, but also in a way of contributing to the wider com community. But we need to actually have a, per that's why I think, you know, with the agenda that, that Tanzania has now, how do we actually combine government, academic resources, private sector, development partners? Because we all need to co invest in it. You know, if each one of us try to carry it, we will not be able to do the level of investment that is required. So that's what we need to go, you know, try to, to, to crack. And just the last point, you know, we, we, you know, in discussions with Leanne here, you know, we try to see, okay, how can we help democratize some of that data? How do we make it more easily available? So because today there is a lot of soil data, you know, that sits around or soil maps, but it, it's fragmented, it's siloed, it's, it's difficult to get hold of. So how do we actually open that field and make that more easily available as one of the unlocks? Very good. And, and I said I was going to come to you, Lee, and, and I realise there are different views out there, uh, and, and Arnie is pushing us to not a binary. Uh, we've talked about the multiplicity of solutions. So, so, so where do you stand on this discussion of fertiliser or natural farming or plurality of solutions? What, what would be your take and, and comment to everybody here with their views? Well, I would start by saying I completely agree. There's no one blanket solution for all farmers. And so you, I'll tie this into the vision question because really it's about an, creating an enabling environment where farmers can innovate for her context, socially, economically, biophysically. And we used to, I mean, maybe the people before me, used to rely on demo plots 
have a demo plot, this is how you need to farm, and then farmers come see the demo plot, and then they leave and they do it on their farm, just like that, right? But this has never worked, and it's never going to start working. So what we do at C4 eCraft is we do on-farm experiments. We work with thousands of farmers, households, and track what they're doing, what innovations are farmers doing. We've been doing this in Kenya, in Makoweni, Kitui, and Machakos County, and we've been monitoring 3,000 households for seven years on their innovations around agroforestry, composting of manure, and doing some versions of side pits. There's so much innovation going on, and I think now that we have the citizen science tools, amazing monitoring tools, we can collect large data sets, messy, super messy, of what these farmers are doing and innovating on their farm. And guess who's collecting the data? It's the farmers. So we're also doing the monitoring with the farmers. So I think there's a real opportunity here to have innovation with farmers, pastoralists, companies, scientists, governments, um, organizations, so that we really can scale healthy soil globally. It's not going to be through one solution fits all. Very good. And come back to you, Minister, and in a second we're going to come to you, uh, everybody in the room, for your questions. So I hope there's a microphone available for you, but in a minute get your hands up. But you, you've heard a whole range of, of responses here, Minister, the different strategies, the multiplicity. When you listen to this and when you listen to different experts, are you attracted in particular directions or do you, do you think, no, really, there's just, for you as a government, there are a multiplicity of solutions you want to take up? Of course, they do. I do believe it all, though. What, what was discussed here, as we said, that uh, there is no one suit fit for all. Mm -hmm. So we have to have the multiple, multiple solution on the addressing the, the problem. But uh, what I can say that uh, we need to have a proper a policy framework that will have a right call for action that will support a science to practice properly. The second one, for example, the, the part of agriculture we have to do to plant the best agronomic practices that will help to, to conserve the soil and uh, to make sure that the 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 the, the, the soil health is well presented for the for the purpose of preserving the environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Now we're going to um, take some questions from the audience. There's a question over here. A question here. Um, I think we actually have also an invited question. So, lady on the right there, first, and, and then the gentleman here. And I believe there was also an invited question earlier that the, the team wanted to have. So, if you're the invited question, don't hold back, come in in a minute. But we'll, we'll take your question first, introduce yourself, and, and say who you're directing the question to. Hello, uh, I'm Rujuta. Uh, I'm from India, but I'm uh, working with South Asian Nitrogen Hub, and I work in India uh, with natural farming, and I'm a PhD student. Uh, so actually, um, uh, anyone on the panel can uh, uh, answer my question. So actually, uh, I, I have been, uh, I heard about the uh, mechanization and precision farming in developed world to better manage the soil health and nutrients. Uh, but in countries like India, the, where the farm holdings are marginal or small, mechanization or precision farming has been a big challenge. So I would like to ask what can be uh, the alternative mechanisms or tools that can be used by the small, holding, uh, small farmers, smaller, smaller marginal farmers in developing countries for better managing the soils and nutrients on their fields. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, who would like to, to volunteer an answer? Okay, AG first. And uh, we have one mic here and another one. I, I wanted to make an observation about the challenges for those who don't own the land that they farm on. I think I, think I mentioned, mentioned that I'm a landless farmer and I've been operating that way for years and as urbanization, urbanization keeps on coming in, in my case, I get evicted off of property after property uh, regularly. Uh, we talk with the landowner, we try and understand when development is coming, but we're still willing to farm that piece of ground until until 
they're ready to develop it and do something else with it. In other places, you're evicted because someone wants to take the ground away from you, uh, they don't, or they see you're successful and they want to use it for themselves. So there's a lot of different challenges, but I think the really important point I, I'd like to make is if that's the kind of situation that you farm in, where you're not quite sure what the future for the, uh, that piece of ground that you're farming on, it limits how much you might be able to invest in that ground, knowing that it might get taken away from you, or maybe it might go under cement someday. And so you need a different toolbox to get the best crop you can during the time that you have uh, available to farm on that piece of land. And it's a challenge around the planet, believe me, but that's a tremendous amount of the folks, especially in the fruit and vegetable sectors, the small scale, well, it's not even fruit and vegetable, small scale farming sectors, there's a lot of uncertainty. And so this idea that you can take all these good tools and get them in there, but not knowing that you have a future that you're gonna be there for two, three, four years, as opposed to many growers who have the luxury of being in the same piece of ground for several generations, and those farmers know every inch of that farm, every inch of that field. They know where the bad spots are, the good spots, the far, the parts, the far, did I say farts? No, but the, 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 par, the parts that they've improved over time because they can work on it season after season. And that's what I want to say. It's a time patient thing too that you have to realize overnight you can't necessarily uh, uh, change things. So I, I don't know if that answers the question, but it is part of the challenge of what are you going to use in your toolbox given the situation and what it is you're farming and trying to grow. So, Medani means the soil. So, it's the soil. And then Bhandari means to, to the harvesting place where we harvest, where we uh, store. But my question is not that one, but my question is that because I have seen the, 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 uh, the harmless uh, problem in India, in Nepal, or, or that part of the world, and also in this part of the world, because in my workplace that is US. So I have seen the, the problem in the US also. But the major problem, what is going on is this, the farmers are is, is, uh, going away. We were, AJ and myself were talking this morning that uh, the people are really suffering. The farmers are losing their business. And then there is no more attraction in the, in the farming system. So how we can retain that? What, what would be the global, global option to retain farming in this farming sense? So even even when we were talking about the peace and prosperity, so if there is no food, there is no peace. So the food it is, is, is the root is the farming. So how how we can we can uh, retain uh, farmers or, or what would be the mechanism to empower them actually so in, within the business? Thank you. Do you want to take this? So, um, two things. I was just reminded of Dr. Ratan Lal, who won the World Food Prize for soil-centric approaches in 2020. And he really tells us all the time that we need to elevate farmers in society more. So that when a young child is asked, you know, what do you want to be? Farmer is an option instead of a, a not an option, right? So I think it's really important that we all start recognizing the critical role of farmers. And I wanted to make one more point about how we think about soil. So Dr. Lau says we should think about soil as our bank account. You cannot just keep withdrawing from it, right? We have to give back. So I think that principle of also giving back to soil, and you were saying that when you have good soil, the farmer looks good, right? So there's benefits all around, uh, including economic benefits when you're keeping your soil healthy. Okay, carry me to you as well. Okay, so quickly, uh, I think to the lady there, um, one of the ways to get farmers to get into precision farming and mechanization, and we are talking about smallholder farmer, I'll tell you it's hard. <laughs> it's definitely hard. But uh, I'll give you uh, uh, what we do here in Africa, is that we get the farmers into cooperatives, 
And once the cooperatives that where they are financed, then they, they, they can be able to uh, get mechanization, so they can be able to get tractors. So we have partners. As OCB, we've uh, collaborated with partners that uh, have tractors, uh, small tractors that they can be able to, le uh, to lease to farmer groups, and they can be able to achieve that mechanization. So I think uh, getting farmers in groups so that they can be able to gain uh, would help. Now, on to the question on how do we assist uh, uh, the second question. Uh, I'll say that uh, um, I'll actually talk from uh, our experience. We do have a, pro a program where, of course, we know that farmers have a challenge. Farmers have to be in a structured value chain for them to see farming is profitable. So for as long as farming is not profitable, then farmers will keep, you'll keep losing the farmers. They will all get, it, get out of farming. So what we do with uh, one of our, again, uh, flagship programs that we run called AgriBooster is that we put, uh, we bring together partners who can provide financing, can provide insurance, can provide uh, inputs, so of course we become one of the uh, players who can provide uh, these uh, inputs. And, uh, and we see that farmers, of course, once now they are financed to be able to get a solution around farming, they, can, they continue, they farm, and they get yields, and you get results out of that. Thanks very much. And we have time for one last question. We're going to do a quick round now, panel. I realize some of our panel have to go. So uh, your question, and then we'll wrap up the panel. Your name is Woods, Chief Innovation Officer of OCP. First of all, congratulations, everybody, to this uh, amazing panel. So I think it's, uh, it's very nice to see a farmer here together, like discussing. So it's, uh, I'm very glad to be part of this uh, discussion here now. So I think the, the smallholder farmers uh, discussion is already done, but I would like, maybe anyone that wants to comment, but uh, I would return to the, the question to, to Lee as well. So I, I love when you brought the rat mouth, right? So it's a uh, it's really great uh, guru on, the, on soil carbon sequestration, and he has been doing an amazing job. And then rat himself, like uh, when he brings uh, the needs of nutrients to build soil organic matter, they are higher than the needs only to produce food. Because at the end, soil organic matter is not only carbon, but we have all the nutrients together. In this discussion, not to go back to the organic part, as I, I also understand that again, it's not the point here, but I would like to hear your, your again, perspective on especially com uh, maybe contrasting, like the, the agriculture done in the temperate conditions, richer soils, to what happened in Africa. So if, uh, again, sometimes we, it, we tend to talk about, again, bringing the nutrients like it was uh, somehow a magic, it's gonna appear there, the microorganisms are gonna bring them, this is gonna happen. But oh, of course, they're gonna be part there, they're part of importance of building these healthy soils. But how do we unleash this, uh, this soil health, especially these poor soils of Africa? How do, is it really importing biomass from somewhere else or to producing biomass locally? If we do import a biomass from, where does it come, going to come from? And just a little bit of this discussion around these uh, different types of soils. Who, who wants to take this? No. So I think let's get a beer after this because this is a really big question. But I think what's also happened in the U.S., if I think of mollus, the soil type of mollusol in Iowa, it's naturally very nutrient rich by definition. It has a 50 centimeter layer, um, thick organic matter. Um, and so we've been able to farm there by mining it. But here, if I look at where in Makoweni, a county here in Kenya, it inherently has lower fertility. The parent material is granite, and there's also volcanic as well, but on the granitic soils, it inherently has lower fertility. So our starting point is totally different. And so I think the first step is really one, stop any degradation. And then if you're working on a degraded soil, it's really about building that organic matter back, putting soil structure back, so that you can actually have nutrient cycling. But I, I take you up on the beer. I think you're offering that. Okay, thank you very much. We're gonna finish this panel with a rapid fire, very short answers. Um, and, and we did tell you in advance the answer is gonna be a minute. But uh, time is pressing, and Arnie needs to be somewhere else, and possibly others too. So we're gonna give you 20 seconds. And the 20 seconds is, if very brief, what is the single most important thing 
uh, what needs to be done in improving soil health globally from your perspective. So let's start at the end and pass the mic this way. The single most important thing that you think needs to be done. I, I think you have to respect the soil. So whether it's com compaction, erosion, all the things that would degrade it, uh, you have to recognize that that's what you have to do to, first of all, fix the, the, the bad, bad habit or the habit that you've created, make, make it right so you're building soil instead of letting it degrade. And compaction happens to be one of the big ones that we did talk about. Thank you. Next. I love that this was not given to us ahead of time. So um, I will say collective action for financial investments to actually implement and monitor healthy soil. Thank you. So um, kind of appreciation to the US State Department where Blinken saying that there's no security without food security and there's no food security without soil health. So I think you know, like elevating the soil agenda to that level is a security issue and to understand that fully, I think that's one. And second, if it's one thing I would like to target, is the data piece. Uh, we have a lot of data, but it's not structured, available, or functioning in a way where that money needs to flow to the right farmers or to the right people. So data is key. Thank you, Minister. I think we have to, the world in the a collaboration, we need the, to have a joint effort on the on the soil health, especially to keep on the collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much. And me lastly. Okay, so uh, we strongly believe as uh, OCP uh, in the narrative of feed the soil to fill the world. And we can only do this by sustainably uh, uh, getting customized solutions for smallholder farmers. Thanks so much. Well, thank you. I think a round of applause to our panelists. Great game for wonderful discussion together, and I'm sure these discussions are going to continue. Thank you all of you for joining us, and we hope you enjoy your rest of your day.